I think we're good. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar series. Today we have Jason George, who is back with us again, and will be presenting animal skulls, antlers, and dinosaur footprints. We have been waiting for this one for a few months now, which is really exciting. Um, my name is Stephanie Keeler. I am the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy, and I want to say a special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for supporting the work that we do. On your screen now, you should see the calendar of events for May and June. We have a couple of events left this month. Tomorrow we have birding in the morning and forest bathing in the evening. And then on Sunday, we have beginner birding um, right early in the morning. So please join us for those programs. You can join at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash events to register. And our June calendar is up and live as of last week. So you can check that out as well. Um, in June, we have evening talks in Chapel House. We have forest bathing in both English, Cantonese and Mandarin astronomy nights, yoga, and much more. So check that out on our website. And if you have the means to support our programs and protecting Riverwoods wildlife, please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate. Another event you may have seen on our June calendar. And if you wanna meet Jason in person for an indoor presentation, then followed by an outdoor walk with him around Riverwood, Join us on June 8th for a free program. You can register on our website as well and donations will be taken at the door. So please join us. Uh, there's spaces still available so you can check that out on our website. And as always, myself and the Riverwood Conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat and Haudenosaunee Nations. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And today we have Jason George joining us with us today. I have lost you though, Jason. I don't know where you went. Sorry, one second. What? Oh, there, there, I found you, sorry. <laughs> we have Jason George with us again. No worries, is, Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, wonderful. We have Jason with us, who is a wildlife photographer and presenter who retired from teaching to pursue his passion for wildlife. He has traveled to every continent except Antarctica, having some epic experiences along the way. Jason now uses his passion for wildlife to inspire future generations to help animals as he shares his work. Jason has presented to school groups, girl guides, special needs groups, and groups in his parents' home country, Jamaica, about his passion for wildlife. I will post some links in the chat bar right now for those of you watching on Facebook. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Jason, you can take it away now. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward to this one. Um, I hope that everyone enjoys it. I do know that this is maybe a little bit of a unique or unusual topic, but as most people who know me, I'm a little bit odd. So we're going to try to have some fun with this. Um, hopefully it goes over the way I think. And again, you might see some things that maybe you're not fully into, but I hope that you enjoy it and just enjoy the journey. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to write them in the comment section or the chat, and I will answer all of them at the end. Um, but as you can see here, there's a little YouTube uh, QR code that people can scan and sort of follow along. Videos don't always come across very well when I'm uh, doing a virtual presentation. So I actually made a video of this setup where it includes some things that aren't in this presentation on the YouTube channel. And there's also things that are there that might not be here. So you might enjoy it and let's get started. So that first one you actually saw a picture was of my Algonquin gallery, which recently closed. And if you notice, there were actually some skulls there because I think that they're a part of nature. Um, and the animals, so I, I'm actually quite interested in them. So 
The agenda for today is I'm going to start with an intro where I talk about sharing and finding, then we'll talk about art and what some people maybe do with some of the bones and stuff. Then we'll move on to small animal skulls, then we'll go to antlers and horns. Then we'll head into some of the larger skulls. And then I've got these two bonus items. And then we're going to end with a safari hunt because everybody seems to really enjoy my uh, safari hunt. So we'll definitely continue that. So when we go out, um, so this is my loft. And this is a space that I actually built to kind of store all of my stuff because not everybody likes seeing skulls. And I totally get that. I also have a few more skulls than maybe the next person. So this is one of the displays that I have with most of my skulls. And don't worry, we'll get a little bit closer and in depth with these skulls, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of an example of the display that I have. When we're out thinking about animals, most of the time we think about the animal and we don't actually focus on maybe the other. They eat the meat and then they'll leave the bones. So when I was in Africa, I got to see a cheetah chase and it was awesome. And the cheetah got really close, but unfortunately it was a learning experience this time for the cheetah and it didn't get to eat, right? That's the side of um, animals that maybe people don't talk. I was a little bit more fortunate depending on how we're looking at it. And I got to see some lions drinking from water. Well, normally when a lion drinks, it means that it's feed after. Well, not all the time, but they tend to have a drink before they go and feed. So we actually watched these lions and they went and they did feed. But with the, these things being in Africa, I, it makes it a lot tougher to collect bones and stuff. So some of the things that maybe you find closer to home are crayfish, right? Seagulls eat them, bird, other birds. Um, lots of animals will actually eat these things, right? This one is actually uh, from Simco. Look at the colors of it. Animals can actually be, or crayfish can actually be pretty cool. And you might find them. This might be where you maybe start your collection. Maybe you get lucky and you see a cool experience. So for example, this guy, Kevin, he saw this experience of an otter ripping apart a snapping turtle. And honestly, I'm a little bit jealous that he got to enjoy that, but I actually caught the end of it and I found the snapping turtle shell in March of the following year. And I actually returned it to the Algonquin Park Wildlife Services because it had a tag on it so that they could do some research and actually get some information. In return, they actually sent me two painted turtles and they actually sent me that little tag back. So I to keep it as a little keepsake. It's pretty cool that they actually have been tracking this specific turtle for like 21 years. I wonder what information they'll get from it. Other times I see random things and this day I was actually driving to go see some owls and I saw this weird creature at the side of the road. I've actually made a YouTube video about this whole experience with the ditch beavers and I saw this beaver crawling on the side of the road and I enjoyed it. And to be honest, it was a pretty awesome experience because most of the time when you see beavers, they actually end up like swimming away from you, or at least that's what I think. Right? But these beavers didn't seem to care about me and I got to watch them and I was, man, I was maybe an arm length away from them at a certain point. But the cool part about this beaver is it actually led me into finding something else, right? They were in the ditch on the other side of the river. I looked and, oh. There is a dead deer. Yeah. I, I investigated a little bit and I did leave it, right? Because I do believe that you should leave bones and stuff there and the food for the animals to leave. Don't get me wrong. I do take some things, but you got to leave some of them for the animals because they actually become important to the whole like ecosystem. And I only take the ones that I need or I'm going to use for educational purposes. So while I'm out walking, I tend to find some random bones every once in a while. And again, have you ever found a bone? Hmm. They're kind of cool to see. And I don't always know what they are. And other animals get pretty smart. Here you can actually see a, a frog who's actually sitting on a, a bone 
waiting for the flies and stuff to come and probably sit on the bones and then it'll eat them. Hmm. It's all a part of this whole ecosystem and mother, mother nature taking care of itself. Here's one I found that we'll, we definitely will take a closer look at, but it actually looks like the tree fell on this one. And I'm not sure if it is fell on it after it was died or if it might be, have been the reason that it was actually like it got caught under this tree. But you never know where you'll actually see it. If you see something like this, this is referred to as an owl pellet. This owl pellet is a great spot if you're looking to try to find um, skulls and bones. Because an owl pellet is basically fur and bones. It's from the animal that they ate. And then they cough up that pellet. All the stuff, soft stuff comes out the backside. And then this pellet of fur and bones comes out. You do have to sanitize and clean all of these things, but this is maybe a great place for some people to maybe start their investigation on the creepier side of animals. Sometimes you might see other kinds of poop. Often I make jokes about this being nature's chocolate, but this is actually not nature's chocolate, but this is moose droplets. Yeah, it's funny to try to investigate and learn all about the, the, the good and the bad of nature. Understanding these kind of things might actually help you find more animals too. And there's actually this deer that I found that's pretty close to my house that I investigated and I actually brought my nieces to see. And it was pretty cool because they actually really enjoyed seeing these, um, these bones and all of that. They actually made this like heart thing and we talked about how the, this deer died and just it was pretty cool and then they made this little heart thing to actually sort of like show that they cared about this uh deer that died and then i brought it up oh, no. hold on a second there we go and then i went back in the springtime with a, a friend's kid and they, they actually brought their camera and they were taking pictures. And it's actually started getting me thinking that maybe more people than I think actually enjoy um, bones and stuff. It, again, they're not for everybody, but we all get the, the circle of life and that some people are, some things have to die for other things to survive. And if this deer, I'm pretty sure died and was eaten by coyotes, all natural causes. And it was a pretty large male deer, if I'm not mistaken. So I have some pretty cool skulls and this is a Highland cow skull and we'll come back to this. But when I do presentations in person, I like to bring some of my skulls with me. Um, even when I go to markets, I'll actually bring some of my antlers or when I go to jobs to pick up my prints, I will bring some just to kind of entertain and educate people. Here you can see a, a moose skull, a moose vertebrae. You can even see that painted turtle uh, shell that I got from Algonquin in that bottom picture. It's just, it's honestly, it's pretty cool the things that you can learn and understand of maybe about certain animals or like even your own bone structures. And then there was my friend Chloe and I brought I took decided that I wanted to take her on this wildlife trip and I brought her all of my stuff to make it a little bit easier because the room I have isn't all accessible to everybody, but I can actually bring a lot of the stuff to people because I have some traveling stuff. And I made this awesome presentation about it. And then we went out on a tour to actually find some live animals and we got pretty lucky. We saw, I think that day, seven snowy owls and one bald eagle. Right, it was pretty magical. And again, no one was forced to touch anything, but we just learned and shared some interesting questions and facts and things that we found. The cool part is being, being a wildlife photographer, you never know who's gonna come to your door. I had this buddy, my buddy Jimmy that I had recently met, he showed up at my house to show me this large tusk thing. After a little bit of conversation, 
I was thinking that maybe he might give it to me, but his actual reason for coming over that day is he actually wanted to work on a book with me. So stay tuned to learn more about this book, but it's not ready. It's getting close. And we'll talk more about this test. Do you know what kind of test this might be? Think about it. It's almost up to my nose and I'm six foot two. What kind of animal could have a test this big? So enough about me. Let's learn about the art side of what I think uh, people when they have like bones and stuff. So luckily being the person I am, I do a lot of educational stuff. So I get gifted. <laughs> So this is some this is one of those gifts. Someone sent me a box full of creepy crawly things, and then someone gave me a bunch of skulls and just helped me to have something to travel around and share uh, my knowledge. And we can learn so much by looking at it. Other people will actually paint and draw on them or even burn them. So you can see this big one has painting, and that's actually from the guy Jimmy. Um, he made this one in 2018. Uh, the bone on the bot that's actually a horse jaw that he painted. Um, the one on the bottom that looks like a sail ship, that's from Cuba, and I'm told that's a cow bone. Um, and then there's some smaller things. And I've used a golf ball here um, to sort of try to help people understand the size of these things. I've tried to keep it consistent, so I've used a golf ball throughout the whole thing. So here you can see some antler parts. And the one on the left is more of a the tip of an antler, and that's my carving. I'm not very good, I'm just sort of learning. The one on the other side is a cross section of it, and that was made for me. It's supposed to be a blue jay, because I'm Jay George. It'd be better if it was a purple jay, but there's no such thing that I know of. But look at the detail. Yes, mine needs a little bit of work, but it was my first attempt. But that blue jay, it looks amazing. All that effort and work, man, the things that you could do with this. There's actually this really cool project that I'm working on. Um, if you go on my YouTube channel, you can find out more about it, but I'm actually making this walking stick and it's gonna be decorated with all kinds of artifacts and bones um, that I found in the wild It's or have been given. It's gonna have a hippo tooth. It's gonna to have some antlers. It's gonna have some moose parts. It's actually even gonna have a Damascus knife hidden in it with a copper interlay. There is a little off cut of it. And this whole process, that process is actually being recorded and shared on my YouTube and actually on Bonafide Customs YouTube channel. It's a pretty awesome experience. While we were actually talking about this whole project with the walking stick, we came up with this other project. And I was given this deer hoof, or actually four deer hooves. So we're going to make kind of four of a kind um, deer hoof knives with a Damascus knife. And here you can actually see my video is not out just yet, but Bonafide Custom has released one. This is actually apparently un heard of for people to use the hooves, but it's an, most people don't really use anything or do anything with the hooves, so it just ends up getting discarded. So Bonafide Customs or Rob and myself thought it would be a cool use of maybe these offcuts to kind of show and display the beauty of the deer. Yeah, maybe one day if you come to Wasag, I'll show you this one in person. So let's now get on to actual animal parts. So here you can see some porcupine quilts. The smaller ones are, um, those are Canadian porcupines, right? Their quills don't need to be as long as the other kind of porcupine. The longer ones are African porcupines. So if you think about it, the animals that they're trying to protect themselves from definitely might need to have, like they might have to protect themselves in Canada from like a dog um, or a fox, but in Africa, they've got to protect themselves from the lions, the cheetahs, right? So they have longer porcupine quills to kind of keep those animals at bay. And then we've got claws. And the cool part is I only recently got these claws. These claws were given to me while I was on a trip to 
Algonquin Park actually just shut down my gallery. And these two awesome people came up to me and they're like, we have something for you. And they gave me a fox claw, a porcupine claw, and a bear claw. The bear claw is the biggest one. And it is, honestly, it's the size of the golf ball. That's maybe why bears can do such damage to animals and to fish while they're fishing for them. Does anyone know what this is? So normally when you see this, these are very small and they're very fragile. Those two big ones on the top and the bottom, when I found them, they were kind of confusing to me because I'd never seen them this big. But upon further observation, I realized that they were sand dollars. These are sand dollars that you will find normally in like Florida or Jamaica, any like salt water and they, like they're kind of cool. And I think it's actually awesome to know that they actually get so big. The bottom one is honestly, it's the size of my palm. It's amazing to get to see these kind of things. But enough with the small things. Let's focus and look at some skulls. So here is a co my collection of skulls all laid out just so that you can see some size comparison. And we're going to now actually get into a little bit more conversation about these skulls right, but looking at look at looking at them from each side is it's actually awesome to see that a lot of skulls are actually kind of similar you can actually start to see which animals are kind of related to each other right certain ones look a little bit more similar than other ones can you figure out which one's which? Don't worry, as we go through, you might be able to figure out some of them. So here's the first two that I want to talk about. These two are very similar. One is a, a lot larger. I wish I actually had the third one in this, sort of this tax or this species or line. The, the smaller one is a fox skull. So it's a red fox. And then the bigger one is a coyote. One day I hope to get a wolf skull. That would be really cool. But I'll wait for it to happen. So if we look at them from the side, you can actually see that their teeth and their jaw lines are very similar. Right? As we open them up, we can actually start to see um, the jaw bones are connected. And if you do a good job of cleaning them, they'll actually still stay together. But jaw bones actually will tend to fall apart when you go to clean them. Um, so again, they look very similar. Again, some of you might not have ever seen a, probably have seen a fox, but have you ever seen this black fox? This black fox is actually a red fox. So if we look at the picture of the family of foxes, you can actually see, looking at mom there, you can see that black hair. So the, this one on the bottom, this is a melanistic red fox, and it's kind of a rare fox. It's not saying that it's super rare, it's just not commonly seen. And she'll stay that way for the rest of her life. Her brothers and sisters looked exactly like the mother in this picture. And her babies looked exactly like the ones in this baby, but they will have the recessive gene that she has. And one day maybe they will meet up with another male fox and be able to have their own melanistic red fox. This is probably my favorite of the fox animals. <clears throat> but let's move on to some of these other pictures. So one of the things that foxes will do is they'll actually find these holes or covered holes on the side of the road and they'll start digging at them. You might not know what's on the other side. Those are turtle shells. It's crazy to think that turtles drop like a hundred, or sorry, probably 20, eight to 20 eggs at a time. And then a fox will come by and it'll just rip them apart and eat them. Again, it's the cycle of life. But every once in a while, these turtles will hopefully grow and become big. That's why we need to take care of our turtles. Because right? there's a lot of predators that will actually eat them. Not just once they're adults, but even just in the shelf form. So here is a painted turtle. And this turtle, um, 
was studied and there's a lot actually known about this turtle. They know how it died or suspect how it's died. But the thing to me when I talk think about turtles is a lot of people have talked about, oh, the shell's a part of the turtle. And I'm like, I don't fully get that. So I created this display box so that you can see both sides of the turtle. And in this one, you can actually see the vertebrae or the, the spinal column that's actually a part of the shell. And I love to bring this to presentations and to markets because this is when people start to realize, whoa, the shell is a part of the turtle. And we start to maybe respect the shell a little bit more. So maybe next time we see a turtle, we're a little bit more careful with how we pick it up or that how we help move it. Here's a painted turtle. Well, here's a couple painted turtles, just so that you can see what they look like a lot. Unfortunately, I don't have pictures of every animal or skull that I'm showing because I wanted to try to focus more on skulls in this presentation, but I thought I'd throw a couple of live animals for us to see too. So here are three that to me actually look quite similar. We have a possum, a lynx, and a raccoon. The lynx is the most different out of these three. It's more similar to a cat. You can see when you look at the eye sockets, how round they are, where the other ones are more elongated, right? And we're gonna keep them in the same order. So you'll know that the possum's on one side, um, it has less teeth. It was actually found on the side of the road, um, hit by a car. But as we look, you can see the, the eye structure and that's really the only difference. The lynx uh, skull is very similar to like a cat skull, right? Like your domestic cat, which is how maybe we start to realize, oh, maybe the lynx is more like a cat than a dog. For some people, they might not realize that until you start looking at the skulls. Right, this side angle, you can also see that the teeth, the, the teeth are now a little bit different. The possum and the lynx have very similar teeth, where the raccoon might be a little bit more closely related to potentially like that fox or the raccoon if we look at it from this angle. But again, all of them have that same similar structure for the most part. And again, skulls are a pretty cool thing to me. Um, the cleaning process might not be the best because um, it can be a little bit stinky, but the end product and the things that you can see and learn from them, I think are pretty cool. And here's a pot or not a possum. This is a raccoon hanging out in the water, right? Did you know that raccoons can swim? Yeah. Not everybody does. Well, while we're in the water, let's talk about a water animal. The crocodile. So we have a crocodile. This was actually recently added to my collection. Um, this one is actually um, given, was donated to me by Jimmy. He had two of them, he didn't need to. That's the best part about my collection. It's gross because a lot of people don't want something or they have, or they've gotten married and the partner doesn't want it around and my collection grows. It's pretty cool that way. And then I use the stuff to share with people. This crocodile is missing a couple of teeth, but they've got lots of teeth. And I don't think it needs its teeth right now, let's be honest. Have you ever seen one in the wild? Well, here's one in Jamaica. You can see how much bigger this one is. This one is maybe one of the largest crocodiles I've seen in the wild. This was taken in the Black River in Jamaica. Man, what beautiful animals they are. Prehistoric. You ever seen an animal with so many teeth or such beautiful teeth? Hmm. Well, here's an animal that has awesome teeth. Do we know what this one is? I'm not sure what the small one is. I know what animal the big one is. So this small one here, I think, is a beaver, a baby beaver. It could also be a muskrat, right? It could potentially be any one of those. You can see by the teeth that it's within that same rodent family. And 
one day maybe I'll figure it out. If anybody here knows what animal this is, that I would greatly appreciate that knowledge. Um, but this one here, this is a beaver. And I got, was given this, and then I started seeing the ditch beavers, and I was like, oh, man, getting to see these teeth up close were, was awesome. Actually, one of the funnier experiences I have with a beaver, I was in Algonquin Park watching it just destroy a tree. It, it was a, probably about the size of a, a bottle of juice, like a two-liter bottle of juice, and it just 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 took it apart, took it down in, honestly, probably 10, 15 minutes. But as it took it down, it kept trying to decide which angle it wanted and it would pick from this side and then the next side. And then it dropped the tree. And as the tree fell, it came close to me. It, it actually hit my fro. Yeah, that's right. The, the beaver dropped the tree on my fro. Oh man, that was a close call. It was only the branches that almost hit me. But the reason beavers cut trees is it's its food source, but it, their teeth also are always growing. If they don't eat or gnaw on these trees, their teeth will grow and they'll end up killing themselves. Well, that's part of the reason. Look at how big these teeth are and how beautiful they are. So here you can see the, an Algonquin beaver and also a ditch beaver again, right? This is what they do in action, right? I love a beaver. Have you ever seen a beaver? Have you ever been close to one? Yeah. Well, let's now look back at this picture so that we can see them in relation to each other. So we've got that small beaver skull, then we've got a big beaver, a crocodile, um, Possum, lynx, raccoon, fox, coyote. That looks like a bear skull, but we haven't talked about it yet. So we'll we'll get there. And then we've got that moose jaw, or sorry, a horse jaw, and then a moose jaw. And then there's some hooves up there, it looks like. Don't worry, we'll talk about those also in a little bit. So looking at these jaws, so let's compare the moose jaw to the horse jaw. You can see that they're very similar, except the horse jaw has this hole in it. And it's the only jaw that I've ever found that actually has a hole in it. I don't have many horse jaws that I've ever come across. So I don't know if it's a thing that happened with all of them. But there's a hole in that. Is this just because it's old and damaged? Right, look at the moose jaw, it's all solid. Every other jaw I've shown you has been solid. I wonder what this does. Is there a reason behind it? Who knows? So now that we've started talking about jaws and horses, that sort of brings us into that, this next part. This is maybe my favorite part, is finding and looking for antlers. So this is my collection of antlers and horns. Do you know what those big ones are? Those big ones? Yeah. They were actually bought for my friend's dog. But once the dog got them, they're actually really light and brittle. And those big ones weigh less than the ones in the middle and way less than the one on the right. But do you know what animal has those big ones? Here's a hint. You've all held it in your hand at some point in your life. Yeah, that's right. You've held this animal in your hand at some point in your life. Let's take a closer look. Wait a second. That's a golf ball. So when we look at a, this antler, we can see that there's a flat part, and then there's a piece that connects to another part, and it branches out. Um, some people refer to those big flat parts as paddles. Um, but this animal is a caribou. So the caribou is um, also referred to as a reindeer, but the caribou is on the quarter. Right? We've all held a quarter at some point in our life, I'm assuming. And so 
Let's take a closer look at just one antler or one caribou antler. And look at the size difference. Look at, look at how big those paddles are. And you can actually see the veins growing up, right? This one was from a farm and it was then used for potentially the dog, but because they're so much lighter, the dog, when it bit through them, it was sort of like having a chicken bone effect and it would actually break them apart. So they were of no use to my friend, so they gave them to me, added to the collection. Didn't think I'd ever have caribou antlers. Yeah, kind of cool. Right, and these ones, so antlers, when they grow, they'll have this velvet on them, right? So you can kind of see a little piece of velvet that hasn't been taken off on this antler, right? And caribou antlers are different than deer antlers and moose antlers is they don't actually fall off during the season, they just continue to grow as far as I know. So maybe that's why they look different. Maybe that's why they're so big and, but I guess moose samples are large too, but they fall off. Oh, but yeah, back to the caribou antlers. It's really cool that they're not all the same, but caribou, deer, moose, they're all in the same family. They're just slightly different. So here is a caribou that's alive and it's in Alaska. Um, this is actually in Denali National Park. There, we actually came across two caribou walking across the street. Well, one walking across the street, the other one foraging in the grass. They, even with their antlers being so large, it's crazy how well the one can actually hide because it actually looks like the trees in the background. Hmm. This, this is probably the, the thing that I find the most, deer antlers. Have you ever found a deer antler? Well, when you find a deer antler, it's referred to as a shed, and there's a natural shed, and then there's something else when you try to take it from a deer. And we'll look a little bit closer at that in a little bit. But here you can actually see, these are all natural sheds. You can see how there's that bumpy spot at the bottom. Right, and it's got that nice round edge where in this picture, you can see the one has a round edge and one has a pointy edge. So the one with the pointy edge was actually cut out of the deer. Someone was, I'm not sure why they took this small one out, um, but, they ended up handing it off to me, giving it to me. And this is where how you, or one of the ways to tell if it's a natural shed or if it was potentially a deer was harmed. I was told that the deer had died and then they cut this one out. That's how you can tell, or at least again, one of the differences between a natural shed and a non-natural shed. Here you can actually see two antlers and they look very similar. To be honest, if I'm not mistaken, they actually might be from the same deer one year apart. Yeah. I only say that because I know where the deer antlers were found. And I know that deer antlers sort of look the same year after year. They just get a little bit thicker. If you look at these ones, one's a little bit thicker than the next one. I also mentioned that animals will actually eat them. So a deer antler and a moose antler, they're quite heavy. And in the winter time, food becomes scarce. So the animals will actually drop them so that they will eat less food, or at least that's what I think. And then when they drop them, they become food for other animals. Squirrels, porcupines, all kinds of things will come by and start eating them. This one here that I'm showing you is probably my favorite deer antler that I've ever found because it has all of these groove marks and bite marks. Like, look at that bite mark. Oh, man. That one's almost all the way through. It just shows you how much animals 
appreciate and enjoy animal parts being left in the floor. But it also sort of helps me educate people. Like this is this is a pretty cool one because I've never found one that has been chewed like this. Right, I could almost put my, I can put my finger all the way through that. Have you ever seen a shed that was eaten like this? Well, when a deer does shed its antlers, they don't shed both of them at the same time. Sometimes they drop one at a time. So here we actually get to see a unicorn. This is just a, or at least I call it a unicorn. This is probably the closest we'll get to seeing a unicorn, or at least I will in my lifetime. So this is a deer with one antler. And it looks like those two that I just showed you. Maybe it, what, it is this deer's antlers. Who knows? You ever seen a unicorn? These are my favorite deer to photograph. This is probably my favorite antler that I've ever found. If you look closely, you can see there's like a pointy tip and then there's a nub. I'm not sure what this means about the growing cycle or what happened, but it means that there was something that caused both of these tips or points to actually not grow the way that they should have, right? What's crazy is I actually found the other one. So I found the matching pair of antlers. That to me, that's, this might be the only matching pair of antlers I've ever found. The cool, again, the cool part is you can totally see that these nubs are very different. And it's like, man. And then I started thinking, and I was like, wait, I've taken a picture of this deer, right? Not only did I take a picture, I took a pretty cool picture where it's tongues out. And so if we look at where I just circled in this picture, you can actually see the nubs that I'm talking about. Whoa, whoa. I got a picture of the antlers in the air and I found them. Yep, these antlers are being kept for sure. They're in my display case. So this antler has actually become one that's quite Mm -hmm. quite famous for me because it's a kind of a silly picture and the tongue's out. A lot of my animal pictures have a tongue out. And it's actually been published, not only in a newspaper, but also in a magazine. So this magazine is called Our Canada. Our Canada is a digital mag magazine that you can um, find and get it for free. What's really cool is in the recent edition, they actually put me on the front cover of a magazine. Yeah. That's me releasing a sandhill crane, trying to save it. So not only do I pick up bones and stuff sometimes, but I also try to help and save out animals. This is a story for another day though. Hmm, that's the end of my antlers and my horn talk. So let's now move into the large skulls. Hmm, well, while we're on deers, let's look at these two. These are maybe two of my favorite deer stones. The one because it's so large, and the other one, well, it actually has a crack in the antler. But here you can see how they're actually joined, right? And why it would be a natural shed. And you can compare this to what the one looks like, or if you remember, and you can see that the joining part. That's how when you see a a skull, you might know if it's a male or a female that has antlers. But again, they drop them. But you should be able to see some kind of nub on the antler or on the skull to know that it's a male or a female, even if the antlers aren't there. But here is that same skull, the way I found it. Oh, look at the size of that thing. That might be one of the biggest deer I could have ever seen. And it looks like it's pretty old because those antlers are actually very thick. That was a good walk. So here's the other antler or the other deer skull that I keep kept. This one, right, you can see that it's wedged under the tree. 
And upon closer inspection, I noticed that it's actually not in the greatest condition, right? The jaw fell apart. But if we actually take a close look at the antler, you can actually see that it's split. And this is what got me thinking. Maybe the skull just happened to be there and the tree fell on it. But maybe there's a chance that this tree fell and actually pinned the deer underneath it. Because it is a pretty small deer skull. I wonder what actually happened to this skull. Right? And you can actually see some of the bite marks on this skull. So that's why animal pieces should be left. And again, I get that some people might want to take a little bit, but don't take it all, right? Just take a little piece and don't take them all. Like don't take every skull that you find. Leave some for nature's critters to take care of and eat. They need those, the calcium and whatever. It's probably because of people seeing animals eat these things that we started giving antlers to dogs and stuff. Right, so another close look of closer look at all of these bite marks. And here I'll move this video so you can kind of see. So you can see the small skull and then you can see the big skull just to see the size comparison. The antlers are not even close to the same size. The skull's not the same size. What are the big skulls? Man, those things are huge. Before we get on to what the bigger ones are, take a look at them from the back side. Yep, they look very similar to the other skulls that we've been looking at. Maybe all animals are closer, closely related in some way. Maybe closer than we might actually think. The ropes there just as an extra um, safety caution when I'm hanging them on my walls. So you can see where the spinal cord actually would go and join in, and you can see the teeth. Well, these teeth definitely are not super sharp and needed for grinding or cutting up meat. So this must be a plant eater. This one was a very old one. It was left out in the barn. So you can actually see some mold and stuff actually growing on it. And it actually adds a little bit of character in my mind. The sad thing about this skull is it is in pretty good condition, except there's three bullet holes. So I do know the story behind these three bullet holes. And the, the cow was injured or sick, I should say, and they went to put it down. But the first bullet didn't hit properly. The second bullet didn't go in. And then the third one actually went and put the bullet out of its misery. Again, look at the size of the golf ball to try to understand how massive this creature actually was. And this is just the skull. Here's the horn. And this is what makes animals so interesting to me. It's like horns and antlers, depending on the animal, are so different. Right? The caribou had really long, light ones. The, de the deer had small, heavy ones. Well, the highland cow has really heavy, hollow ones. And they don't fall off. They grow with them for the rest of their life. But I love this pattern of how it's like opening up. This is such a cool thing to see to me. Again, every other antler that I have is a solid like base. I wonder what this actually has to do or why it is it? Is it? Or maybe if it was solid, it would just be too heavy to carry. Hmm. Well, if you've never seen a Highland cow, here's one from Scotland because that's where they are from. They're often referred to as the Highland Coo, or the Scottish Cow, or the Hairy Cow. I understand why they call them the Hairy Cow. So one of my favorite animals to photograph, especially right now, is the moose. 
Well, here you can see a male moose and a female moose. And here you can see a wolf. They are predator and prey. They're not even close in size. But I got lucky this day and I saw a lone wolf just walking its path. Yeah, he noticed me, but wasn't too concerned because he was licking his lips and excited about something else. The question is, what was he excited about? And this is where road safety comes into play. So I posted about my experience with this wolf and I found out a little bit more in this Facebook group that I was a part of. So I shared my post and then someone shared me shared this post with me. A moose had been hit by a car and its hip and leg had been shattered. So this wolf was coming to eat the rest of it. This was three weeks before I saw the wolf. I happened to actually see the wolf go through the carcass and I actually took some pictures. So three weeks from when that moose got hit, this is the result. What? Three days later, I went, I happened to be back in the park and it was even cleaner. Man, it is crazy how big that moose was and how quickly it got cleaned. That is just bone. There's a lot of ticks and gross bugs in the bottom that what's making it dark there. But man, that thing is picked clean. I was up there last week um, and I stopped by that spot just to see the development. And now you can see that there's quite a bit of bone that's even gone. People might, people might have taken some, the animals are, were eating some. I know that because I saw the wolf actually eating a bone while I was there. Hmm. Maybe he wasn't licking his lips for the moose. Maybe he was thinking, I should eat Jay. Luckily, he decided not to. I would love to find a moose antler. It's one of the only antlers I don't have in my collection. Moose antlers are massive. Here we can see two in Alaska. Look at how big these things are and how heavy they are. That is probably two and a half feet tall and three feet wide. Imagine having one of those at your house. Well, I would at least like that. That'd be a great little display piece in my presentation. But let's take a closer look at a moose skull. So here is a male moose. You can tell, again, because there are antlers. You can see where you can sort of see that they connect. And again, look at that golf ball. Just understand the size difference. Like their eye sockets are similar to the other animals, except for the cats. What makes a moose and a deer different is that there is a reflective lens in a deer. Um, eyeball as opposed to a moose eyeball which is why you can see it here at night and what makes driving through areas that there are moose a little bit more dangerous because you won't see that moose so if you are out on the road be careful don't drive too fast so here is a great picture of the what a lot of people refer to as the nose turn by so all animals have it it's sort of like the nostrils um, if I'm not mistaken, of the animal. And sometimes when you're cleaning them, they fall apart or they get damaged. But these ones, these ones are in pristine condition. This is probably where I start to realize the actual size difference between a moose and a deer. These are, that's a deer hoof and a moose hoof. Look at the size compared to the golf ball. The deer hooves are about the size of the golf ball. And that moose hoof is way bigger. You know that the hoof is actually hollow. There's actually a bone that goes inside of it. And that's how they move them. Hmm. Pretty cool. 
Well, I've been pretty lucky to actually see quite a few aliveness. I've only ever seen, if I'm not mistaken, two dead ones. But I love to see them when they're alive. I'd actually rather see all of the animals alive. But I do get the circle of life. Maybe you've seen some of my pictures in Reader's Digest. Oh, this is one of the last skulls that I hadn't talked about. This is one of the apex predators that we have in Canada. No, it's not a human. Look at the size of that too. I wish it was a wolf skull that I had, but this is a bear. This is a really old bear that was sick. And again, it's skull setup is very similar to other animals, right? The teeth, you can tell it's a meat eater because it has a sharp pointy one, but it also has crushes similar kind of to the human jaw. We have some sharper ones and then we have some flat ones to mush berries and all of that. If we look right on, you can see that the turbines in the nose aren't there, right? I don't know if this was from cleaning or just because it was so old, but this is a sweet donation that I was given, or one of many sweet donations that I was actually given. This is a black bear. I've seen some brown bears, but I've never seen a brown bear skull. I assume that they would be a little bit bigger than this. Maybe one day I'll get to see one or have one. Normally when you see a bear though, it's sort of running away from you as you can see on this one that's crossing the road, or there was this time where I was out with my buddies and we were out looking at this eagle nest and we heard a splash. And you can see that there's a bear that's actually just swimming across the river. And that could have been a little bit scary in my kayak, but he wanted nothing to do with us. And here is my dinosaur footprint. This one's really cool. This was donated to me probably only because it has a crack in it. But it's, look at the side. Imagine how big that dinosaur must have been. Hmm. Unfortunately, it doesn't photograph that well. So I don't really know how to actually show it, but I just wanted to share this with you. And since it doesn't photograph so well, I figured we should probably include some bonus material. So I actually started talking to my friends about this presentation because talking to Steph, I got all excited about having this new presentation that was slightly different. And man, I got some pretty cool messages. A friend of mine had this. Now, it's a turtle shell. And I know that I've already shown you a turtle shell. But this turtle shell, this one is massive. And it shows the the spine really well. Do you know how big this turtle shell might be? Or what kind of turtle it is? Feel free to make a comment before I actually share. But that is how big it is. That's my hand. My hand is, I'm a six foot two, 220 pound person. My hand is fairly large. And I don't even take up one of the panels of that turtle shell. I forget what they're called, like drawing the blank right now, so please forgive me. But look at the size of that thing. Don't worry, I tried it on. I've always wanted to be a Ninja Turtle, so I tried it on. Just for you to understand how big this turtle shell is. Well, have you figured out what kind of turtle this is? Well, this is actually a green sea turtle. The picture I'm showing you is from um, the Great Barrier Reef. Um, the turtle shell that I showed you was a friend's dad got it, I think like 50 plus years ago. Um, but I was, again, I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I was just glad that they were able to share it with me. Um, and I was then able to share it with you. Have you ever seen a green turtle shell? Or been that close? No, that, that's pretty cool. But this next thing I'm going to show you, it's even cooler. Yep. 
Remember this picture? I showed it to you at the beginning. So when he showed up, I was a little confused with what my buddy Jimmy had actually brought. Me. And I thought it might have been a nose picker. And you know when your nose is a little bit itchy? Oh, this thing would be amazing. He kind of laughed at me and said it wasn't a nose picker. Well, I continued to look at it and I said, well, this thing's massive. Oh, I know what it is. It's a pool cue. So I went and I played some pool with it. There's actually video of me playing pool with it on the YouTube video. It's not a very big or very good pool cue. It is not even a pool cue. It's a narwhal cuts. Yeah, the unicorn of the sea. This might be the closest I ever get to a narwhal. But the craziest thing to me is it's hollow. Man, all these tusks and horns, they're all so different. One day I hope that I actually get to see a, an alive narwhal in the wild. But until then, I guess this will have to do. Well, thank you, Jimmy, for lending me your narwhal test for this presentation. If you're into adult comic books, he has some awesome comic books out there. You can find them on my YouTube. Um, or sorry, on my Instagram. Um, but yeah, check out his stuff if you're into adult comic books. Him and I were working on a, a book together, which is going to be pretty awesome about animals. Um, but let's get into this last aspect. Hopefully you're still enjoying it. Um, but let's do this safari. So when you're out looking for animals, you never know what you're actually looking for. So give yourself a point if you can see the animal and if you know what it is, you get another point. So here's an animal that's about to give birth to animals in the Sega Beach, Solo Beach, Darlington. If I'm not mistaken, there's one in Darlington. Do you know what animal it is? Wait, do you even see the animal? Hold on, let me show you where the animal is. There's one two, three of them in that circle. Yeah, there's a mom and two babies. There might even be a third baby that you can see if you look really closely, but these are piping clovers. But, hey, that one was a little tough. Here, how about this one? Yeah, those are fox kids, right? There's eight of them. Yeah, you can count them. This is the most amount of fox kids I've ever seen. I actually just released a video on the smallest foxes I've ever seen. But there's eight of them. A couple of them are hidden behind the trees. I think there might actually be nine, but one ran into a hole just before I took the picture. Do we see this animal? We talked about this animal. It's one of the big antlers. Yep, the one you held in your hand. No, nope, not a reindeer. Well, you can call it a reindeer if you want, but most of us call it a caribou. Do you see it? Okay, there we go. Now this game is getting good. Well, what about this one? This one's camouflage. Oh, do you see it? Yeah. Nope, a little lower. Yeah, right there. What is it? Oh, yeah, it's a deer. But is it male or female? Oh, you see the antlers? So then we know it's a male. And the in the spring, summer and fall, it's much easier to tell them apart. Winter, you can tell that at the beginning, sometimes not so much in the end of winter. What's this animal? This one had the coolest teeth. Do you see it? It swims in the water. It's got a big flat tail. Yeah, it's a beaver. Wait, you think these ones are too easy? Fine. We'll make them a little bit harder. What's this animal? Is there an animal? Oh, you see this one. Yeah, I've already shown you this animal in this safari hunt. Yeah, that's right. It is a caribou sitting down. He's probably going to the bathroom, if I'm not mistaken. Well, what's this animal? Or what is it? Is it an animal? Some people will tell me it's a bowling ball. 
a hippo in olive. Sometimes when you go out looking for pictures, you don't find what you're expecting to see. Well, this is just mud. It's a mud bubble. It's a mud bubble in New Zealand. But it does kind of look like an animal sticking its nose through it. But no, it's just a bubble. Well, if I did this safari hunt on just the live animals, it wouldn't be fun. So let's now look a little bit closer and let's take you on a safari hunt of skeletons and skulls. Maybe an antler. Do you see it in this picture? Yeah, this one's a little bit easy. I know. Oh wait, you don't see it? Hold on. There it is. That is a deer. I left it in the water. I already have two. I didn't need an extra one. I let the animals have this one. Here's another one. Yep. Wait, Jay, all I see is deer food. I know, that's what most of you are probably seeing. And that's fun. There is a lot of deer food there. But there's also this small skull that's been there. You wanna see it a little bit closer. Okay, so this is what that skull is. I think it might be a possum, maybe a raccoon. Who knows? Maybe one day I'll figure it out. Do you have any ideas or guesses? Here's one of my last pictures for you. Do you see what I'm looking at? I knew what it was from probably 20 feet away. And I got excited and I made this video because it was actually, this video was probably taken a month ago, maybe less than that. And all of a sudden I saw this, oh, this is so cool. Hold on, let's watch a video. Hopefully this video turns out. If not, watch the YouTube video. It'll be the second video in, or the second clip in. Look closely. You see it? Whoa. That is a monster antler. Did you see it before I moved it? Look at it. What a beautiful antler. Well, hopefully you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, I've actually enjoyed setting it up and now I'm going to open it up for questions and answers. If you have any comments, um, or anything, feel free to ask. I have listed a couple questions. If you can't think of any, you can ask me those, but life's open. You can feel free to ask about anything. If you like my YouTube or the or subscribe to my YouTube there, that would be awesome. There's a QR code. And if you just wanna look at more pictures, my website QR code is there too. Um, but yeah, feel free to ask me some questions and I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you so much, Jason, for sharing your images and your collection and your stories. Your presentations are always so much fun. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It, and like Jason said, ask any questions you have. We do have a, a few that have already come in while you were presenting, Jason, but okay. if you want to post any in the comment, the Q&A or chat section, that'd be great. And everyone remember that Jason will be coming in person in June, and I'll just post that link in the chat bar now. So if you want to meet Jason in person and go for a walk with him, uh, you can register using that link. Uh, the first question that came in probably the first two minutes that we started this webinar was from Hayden. So Hayden has been very patient and Hayden has asked, do you get lucky finding fossils or do you use a machine to find them? I, Hayden, I don't know what machine we're talking about that we would use for finding these fossils. Um, 
but I, I normally, if I am going out looking for fossils, I sort of just use my hands and I'll find them in like sh flat shale rock that's been split apart. Um, it would probably be easier to find with a machine of some kind, but I'm pretty low budget and just use the resources that I have. Um, but to be honest, I don't go looking for fossils per se. I would go looking more for bones, sorry, skulls or antlers. Um, and that's what I tend to find more of. Um, I have been given a whole collection of like 600 million year old fossils. If you are into fossils and are in the Wasega Beach area, Hayden, I will give you a handful of them for free. Just don't tell anybody else. Um, but yes, I will hook you up with some uh, fossils because they were given to me and they were given to me to sort of share. So find me sometime and I will give you a few 600 million year old fossils. And I know they're that old because that's what I'm told because this guy bought a museum and he gave me a bunch of stuff. That's where I got the dinosaur footprint from. I didn't know you could even buy a museum, but it somehow benefited me. So that's kind of cool. Awesome. I'm sorry if that's and, not the answer you were looking for. No, I think that's great. And Hayden, if you're in Mississauga area, if you go to Riverwood and you just walk on Cullum Trail, which has been completely washed out, all of the gravel that filled that trail has been washed out. And now it's down to kind of the bedrock. You can find a lot of fossils just by walking that trail. So take a look there too. And something cool that you can do is get like a piece of paper and like a pencil and like lay your piece of paper over top and like instead of taking that because that rock might be too big or you don't want to carry that heavy thing, a piece of paper is much lighter and you take a pencil, you put your paper down and you just sort of shave or color over it on an angle and you'll get to be able to keep that imprint and leave the rock in nature. So that might be something to think about. It's a great alternative. I like that. Um, a couple questions that came in that are coming in now, but I do have one that was asked prior, and I really like this one. Jason, what do you like more, your animal collection or your photographs? Um, I probably my photographs because there's more of them and they connect to more stories and memories. Um, but I love my animal like collection and like, I love this room that I've like, I built this room with my own two hands and it's actually a really cool space. Like I'm hosting a birthday party out of this space um, in July. Um, there's a lot of really like fun and silly things in here. So I don't know, like, so I said that like, um, like the dinosaur footprint, so like, Speaking of like dinosaurs, if you're a Raptors fan, you'll know that they won a championship recently. And so this is potentially, hypothetically speaking, um, the backdrop from the 2019 championship run um, that I was given. So there's some cool random things that are in my loft. So I do really like my loft, but honestly, I'd have to say it would be my pictures because I don't always take something from nature, but I often take pictures of my experiences and my memory. So awesome question. And I've never had that before. So great question. Um, another question that came in from Julie, have you ever seen a flamingo or emu? I have seen probably a hundred flamingos or sorry, there were, in Lake Barango, there's, I think, 2 million flamingos. I've also seen, that was the most I've ever seen at one time. I would say there, there were quite a few in that. When I was there, they were probably close to like a million, but 2 million go there. Um, but the first time I ever saw a flamingo, it was in the Galapagos Islands, and I saw four of them. And that was a pretty cool experience. And then it was like overwhelming when I saw... Um, so many but you ended up seeing so many that like it wasn't even like you weren't even paying attention to them like they were just pink in the background and I found out there were greater and lesser flamingos 
but I've never seen an emu in the wild. It's on your list now. <laughs> it, honestly, I would love to, see, my goal is to try to see every animal that I haven't seen in the wild. Um, legitimately, I'm, there's this lady who found an albino turtle. Um, and I'm trying to let, get her to let me come and see it when she releases it back into the wild. But it's probably like an hour, or sorry, like three hour drive to go and see it. But have you ever seen an albino turtle? Never. I didn't even know there was such a thing. That's it's, pretty and, cool. Right? And that's where I'm like, oh my God. Like, So I'm hoping that they'll actually let me be able to see and get some photos and some video, even if it's just of them releasing it. Because I think it would be cool. Like, I like seeing those new things. Like, I like seeing right. the, um, what, um, like, seeing the, the black, the, the melanistic red fox. Like, when you see something that's unique or rare, like, that's when it's really cool. And then you can, like, it's even fun to, like, share and try to confuse people when I do presentations like this. Mm -hmm. Well, Jason, when you come to Riverwood, there is a famous turkey vulture that lives here at Riverwood. And it is something called leucistic. And so it is black and white. It has Ooh. two colors and it's speckled. So maybe we can keep an eye out for that one. <laughs> I would I would love to see I would love to see see that. And that would have been awesome for my black and white. I know, I was just thinking of that yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, I can add another yeah. animal to that collection. Yeah. That's um, I there's a place where we there like until there was construction, but there was like probably um, close to like 50 uh, turkey vultures that would roost right down the street from me. So cool. Yeah. Although they're not the prettiest animal, they are actually cool in their own way. Yes, exactly. I think that's exactly how you would explain them. Yeah. <laughs> um, Julie asked another question. Has any animal you have photographed come up to you to investigate you? Um, so I don't bait my animals and I don't, um, I try to keep them at a safe distance. But I have had a few animals come potentially a little bit close to me. Um, I had a baby deer come and sit down maybe an arm length away from me. Um, and it was, uh, I was fishing, so like I'm moving my arm and it came, like baby deer are very skittish, but it came and it sat down like almost right beside me. Let me take a selfie with it. Um, if you watch my fox videos, you can see like some baby foxes, they get super close to me and like mom's there at certain points and mom doesn't even care about me. Um, I once got too close to a moose. Um, and I, I learned very quickly, and so I'm going to share this, never walk behind a moose. They do not like it. And, like, I'm talking, it turned and, like, We may have lost Jason just at the end. I hope not, but we'll give it a minute. That may be the end of it, <laughs> which is totally fine. Um, I'm glad that Jason made it through his entire presentation without uh, ending. And there he goes. <laughs> he may come back. Um, Eduardo, we know that you do have one question about how to treat birds um, for educational purposes to keep their bones and their bodies. Um, we will share that with Jason and then he'll get back to you. I'll, I'll share his email with you, with uh, Jason Eduardo so that we can get that, that answer back to you. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Jason. When you see this afterwards, thanks for your great presentation. Um, and once again, please register for Jason's upcoming in-person walk and talk. That would be wonderful. Thanks everyone for joining and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.